Hi, it's Naomi with Sword and Steel, and today we're going to enjoy the White Dwarf at issue 451 or February 2020. Alright, we will have the Tome Celestial, the Iron Suns, the Warlords of Vigilus, the Grand Finale, Faith and Fire Serialized Novel, Warhammer Underworld's Tactica, 20 pages of Hobby Guys, and much more for Warhammer Asia Sigma and Warhammer 40k. Alright. White Dwarf, we've created a monster. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, White Dwarf is a monster of a publication. Oh. I can easily marvel at the sheer volume of Warhammer goodness we managed to pack into each issue of this venerable magazine month in and month out. But now we've gone and created a monster. I hope you've reinforced your shelf because the issue you're reading now is a whopping 160 pages. What sort of divine madness is this? Well, we thought it would be really cool to serialize one of Black Library's favorite works here in White Dwarf. So starting here and for the following eight issues, we're bringing you Faith and Fire by James Swallow. Cool. Ooh, it's about the uh, Adeptus Auratus. Okay. This does sound cool. That will be fun. So many things. Painting question. Colors of the Deep. Oh, so pretty. Look at that. Look at how pretty that is. Uh, dear White Dwarf Tree team, I was impressed by the colour scheme of the Asharan Tidecaster painted by Tom Winstone in the Heavy Metal Painting Challenge in the January 2019 issue. I would love to know what colours he used as I have recently started collecting Idoneth Deepkin and would like to apply his colour scheme to my army. Oh, so pretty. Uh, good question, Adam. We took a trip to Heavy Metal Towers to ask Tom about his colour scheme for you. And there it is. Base coat, screaming skull for the bone armour. That is really pretty bone armour, isn't it? It does look like a shell. Base coat is screaming skull, glaze is troll slayer orange and screaming skull. Skull, so a mix of the orange contrast paint and Screaming Skull. Layer Screaming Skull and White Scar and Layer White Scar. Pretty. Uh, the turquoise cloth and the pink crown. Nice. Did you know that a human is around five to six copies of White Dwarf in height? Well now, you do. Before you ask whose hands are in the picture, I was going to say that it was a bunch of gene stealers, but actually it was just some of our younger customers having a laugh from Warhammer Leon in France. That's so cute. Hmm. First use of it as a measuring device. <laughs> Taking the scenic route. Nice work. Ooh, look at that guy. The green was achieved using a base cut of warpstone glow, followed by a mix of warpstone glow and moot green. And then I picked out spots with moot green and mixed green with flash. Splash gets yellow. Looks very nice, doesn't it? Very nice. That was done by Jeff Painter. Blood Angels Captain by Tom Danvers. Nice metal. Nice little gem too. Imperial Fist and Captain and Ancient by Paul Newick. Looks good. Ooh, cool rust effects. Nice. Well, I guess blood and rust effects. And I like the ground too. The changeling. That is very smooth yellow. Untamed beasts. Oh my goodness. Oh, uh, Darcy Bono. Look at 
that. She's replaced them with goat heads. Really cool. Seraphon Troglodon by John Hopkins. I like the transition of the green into the orange. Looks good. Jungle Tau and Well Wishes. Oh, I like the green. Very pretty. Worlds of Warhammer. Worlds of Warhammer delves into the background of the Age of Sigmar and 41st millennia, looking at how stories are created and legends are born. The subject of Phil's musings this month are architects, gardeners, and hunter-gatherers. All will be explained. Hmm. <laughs> what do we have here? The Maelstrom of a Sundered World. The Eight Realms was born from the Maelstrom of a Sundered World. The Eight Realms were born... In this issue, Iron Jaws, Fire Slayers, and Sylvaneth, and writing army lists. <laughs> I do like that model. I like the paint job on this one, the black and red. It's very striking. The Tome Celestial. The rise of Dakbad. For as long as any Auric can remember, there have been Iron Sons. The promogenitors of the War Clan fought alongside Corkamorka during his first great rampage across the realms. The demonic invasion of Gur was met by bellowing mobs of Iron Sons. When the fist of Gork himself emerged in the bestial lands of the Wild Heart, the Iron Sons raised their voices in savage greeting alongside their fellow greenskins. Yet, despite this proud history of doing ev over everything that looks at us funny, the Iron Sons did not truly rise to prominence until the coming of Deckbed Garot Kicker, arguably the greatest mega boss ever to rule the War Clan. And that must be him. Yep, mega boss Deckbed Garot Kicker. So he, that was the paint scheme back there, right there. Cool. Dressing to impress. All orcs are natural bullies thrilling in pushing around anything punier than themselves. But only the Iron Sons have elevated, showing off to something approaching an art form. The defining colour of their warplay is a bright and striking yellow. While this often makes their approach incredibly obvious <laughs> to the Iron Sons, this is just another example of the orky no watts at play. After all, the more fight an orc gets into, the bigger and tougher he becomes. Hmm. The Age of Iron. Ooh, War Scroll Battalions. Cool. Alright, so our big one, which has all the other battalions in here on it, and uh, one da boss faced war scroll battalion, one Mogor's recruiting crew war scroll battalion, one orc war chanter, one orc weird knob shaman, one plus brute fist, four fist, ard fist, weird fist, or iron fist war scroll battalions in any combination. This battalion can only be taken as part of an iron jaws army that is from the Iron Sons war clan. And they get Bosswag! Once per paddle, if Dakbad is on the battlefield, another orc hero from this battalion can can use the Iron Jaws Wog command ability. This does not stop Dakbad from using the Iron Jaws Wog command ability, but you cannot use the command ability more than once in the same combat phase. Alright, let's see what War Scroll Battalion they have now. Uh, one so the organization is one megaboss on Ma Krasha, deck bad grot kicker. Uh, zero to two megabosses on Ma Krasha, two to three megabosses, and two to three orc brutes. 
the uh, boss himself, Dakbad, must have the right fist of Dakbad command trait. In addition, if Dakbad is on the battlefield at the start of your hero phase, roll a dice on a four plus. You receive one extra command point. Cool. Um, battle scar veterans add one to the attacks characteristic of melee weapons used by models in this battalion, including those used by their mounts. Well, that's pretty cool. That seems really nice. Uh, what is the cost on that battalion? De boss fist 220 for extra attacks and extra command points. Hmm. Uh, Mogors recruiting crew. One mega boss, Mogors. One brute unit, the recruiting crew. One to five orc brutes or orc art boy units in any combination, aspirants. Uh, you can't include more than one of these guys in your battalion. Out to impress the Iron Sons. Cunning ability does not apply to aspirant units from this battalion. Instead, do not take battle shock tests for aspirant units from their battalion from this battalion while they are wholly within 18 inches of Morgors or the recru de recruiting crew. And that one costs 150 points. Seems good. Ah, there's only the three, uh, and that big one was 120 points, so you'll need these two as well, so adds up. Painting the Iron Suns, we have all the layers of how to do it. It's very nice looking orange, well, yellow. Contrast style. Very nice. The death. Oh, that seems like a that, that seems like a pretty big. Let's go by that. Rules of engagement. Pinned by veteran games developer Jervis Johnson focuses on the creation, design, and evolution of the rules for Warhammer Age of Sigmar. But wait. That's not Jervis over on the left, that's Louis Igualar. I I Igualar? And he's here to talk about army lists. Hmm. Okay. Hunters of the Hidden Pass. But... Oh, it's just, I guess, an example. Hmm. He has a living city army. Cool. Born of the Flame. Oh, look at that! Ah! Warcry has Fire Slayers. Alright, let's have a look. Ah, so cute. Okay. So, the Fire Slayers can be Hearthguard Berserkers, Auric Hearthguard, or Volkite Berserkers. And their abilities are a, a double Fire Steel throwing axe, pick a visible enemy fighter within six inches of this fighter and roll a two dice. For each four to five, allocate one damage point to that fighter. For each six, allocate a number of damage points to the fighter equal to that value of this ability. So this is a great little double. There's another double for those with this one. Uh, in case in Molten Rock, until the end of this fighter's activation, the next time this fighter makes an attack action, subtract half the value of this ability from the move characteristic of the target fighter to a minimum of one until the end of the battle round. Well, that is really neat, actually. Uh, stopping a guy in his in its place is um is pretty cool. Uh, useful in Warcry. Double relentless zeal. Add three to the move characteristic of the next move action made by this fighter. This activation since they're dwarves, I imagine that's very useful. Uh, triple duty unto death. A fighter can use this ability only if they have five or more damage points allocated to them. This fighter makes a bonus move, a, mo a bonus move action. Then they can make a bonus attack action. A triple where they do this rampage is really neat. That's cool. Uh, their leader ability is honor our oaths. A fighter can use this ability only if an enemy fighter has been taken down by an attack action made by this, by them this activation. Until the end of the battle round, add one to the attack's characteristic 
of attack actions that have a ranged characteristic of three or less made by visible friendly fighters while they're within six inches of this fighter. Pretty standard, um, nice triple leader ability. Quad, unleash runic fury until the end of this fighter's activation. Add the value of this ability to the attack's characteristic of attack actions made by this fighter that have a ranged characteristic of three or less. It's very nice. Nice quad. Okay, and there we are. Look at all of those. We've got a, yep, overall all of them have a movement of three, which I'm not surprised with them being dwarves. Everyone has a movement of three inches. We've got some that have ranged abilities. We've got some that have, um, well, range three to 15 which is nice, and we've got ones that have a reach of two inches, which is great. And um, we've got ones that have lots of attacks, and we've got 22 health, 12 to 22 health. So that's actually pretty, they're pretty tough little guys, and their toughness is four or five, so they have a fairly decent amount of health for very little points, 90 or 85 points for the little guys, and you know, the slightly better ones at 125 or 110, and the leader, there are three leader options, um, 180, 185, or 170, so these are all fairly cheap. You'll be able to take oh, probably eight or nine dwarves and they've got ones with only three attacks but with range four attacks yeah four attacks four attacks this little guy only has two attacks what is the good of you really oh you have a toughness of five well between the four attacks three strength one to three and a toughness of four versus two attacks 313 i think i would choose that one of the same points but range leader and guys with lots of attacks that's what i would go with new growth in narrowed the sylvaneth are the children of Alariel, the ever queen they re they are vengeful force spirits imbued with the life energy of the mortal realms this impressive sylvaneth army from the Gnarled Root Glade Wargrove was painted by Sam Wilson, who's joined us to tell us all about it. Hello, Sam. Let's have a close look at that. Look at that. I think there's more on the other page. Yeah. Look at her. So I'm generally not a big fan of the beetle. But he did a really nice paint job. And I do like that base. See that base? And you can see it up there too. That's a nice autumn base. Really pretty. We've got Draka and some Spite Revenants. Oh, and a branch wreath. And a tree lord hiding in the distance. Oh! Wow, look at those dryads. Really pretty. I like that red. I like these autumn leaves. They're so pretty. Look at that. Look how pretty that guy is. So pretty. I like the little purple touches on his staff. Nice spirit. Mm, I do like this one. Pretty. There are tree revenants. I want a branch witch. Cool. Oh. Oh, Kurnoth hunters and dryads. Oh, and they've got the painting scheme for what he did. What red did he use? Red leaves. Base coat Mephiston red, washed with Agrax Earthshade and layered with wild red, wild rider red. Well, they look great. I like that. Forty K. In the grim darkness 
of the near of the far future there is only war look at that and in this issue's grim in this issue's grim dark section you'll find psychers crusades and our warlords ready for a massive four-way free-for-all mm. mindfire a fiction the opening of the great rift has seen the number of human psychers across the galaxy increased dramatically yet as you'll soon see in this short story by colin cubbin not all of them are loyal to the emperor <gasps> indominus crusade heroes the indominus crusade is the largest and most potent assemblage of military might the galaxy has seen since the days when the emperor walked among his subjects some of the empire's greatest heroes are counted among the crusade storied warriors indominus <laughs> crusade Pretty. warlords of vigilus Cool. Creepy. That red is a, quite a nice and creepy tyranid. Cave and strike. I like that paint job. And I find that pretty cute. He's standing on top of a wall. I'm not that familiar with that my model, so I don't remember if he regularly stands on top of a wall. That's good. Now, I am impressed by this model. Ooh, it looks like his wings are kind of shiny. I like it. That is like the best Death Guard model I've ever seen painted. I don't actually shudder at the appearance of it. Well, I mean a little bit, but it looks really good really appealing who painted it mark bedford cool looks good let vigilus burn oh cute little flesh hounds in the back to crown a warlord oh it's a battle report don't want to give away the battle report Echoes from the Warp. Echoes from the Warp is a regular column about the rules, tactics, and ongoing development of Warhammer 40k by games developer Robin Crudence. In this month's column, he talks about the new features added to the latest edition of Codex Space Marines. Okay. The Realm of Nurgle. Oh. Fantastical Realms has mutated into Realms of Chaos. Cool. A four-part series. I guess this will be the first one. The Realm of Nurgle. What are we going to see here? Painting your armies. We all know that Nurgle loves green, brown, and yellow, but disease and corruption come in many colors. Here we provide you with a few ideas for painting your putrid legions. I like that one. I like that one too. That is like ghostly creepy. Nice metal. Wow, there is so much going on that metal, on that piece. What is that piece? Chaos War Shrine of Nurgle by Larby Benunes? Larby heavily converted a Chaos War Shrine to show that it has been corrupted by or possibly dedicated to the Plague Lord. He started by building the main body of the War Shrine and mounting the front of it on a carpet of diminutive nerglings. Very cute. The back of the warshine has sprouted legs of its own, which once belonged to plague bearers. Pulling the shrine into battle is a rot fly taken from the plague drone's kit, which has been harnessed to the shrine using the plow from the Horticulus Slimex. Very cool. The Warshrine Magister has been replaced with a putrid Blight King. When painting the model, Larby almost exclusively used contrast paints. Yeah, I would understand why. The bony areas are painted 
skeleton horde, while all the green areas are painted with plague bearer flesh or military green. The metal shrine is iron warriors shaded with snake bite leather and military green. Looks good. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, that that's pretty cute. Quite cute. Painting your armies part two. Look at all that. Wow. Cool. Okay. The suffocating host. Louis Aguilar painted these Nurgle demons after being inspired by a Warhammer TV painting video for decaying plague bearer skin. The idea was to create a force of Nurgle demons that looked like they were carrying some kind of suffocating disease, hence their unhealthy shade of purple. Lewis undercoated all of his models with Corax white, uh, then applied a 4 to 1 wash of Lamia medium and Fenrisian grey. He then followed that with a second wash of 4 to 1 Lamia medium and Druki violet. Next, he applied pure Druki violet to the deepest recesses and then a dry brush of grey sear over all of the skin. The gaping wounds were painted with flesh terrors red, with Argo applied in some places to make it look wet and flesh, and Nurgle's rot make, to make it look like it was covered in rancid pus and slime. Wow. That is really well done. I mean, it's hideous, but it's really well done hideous in the best way. Holy smokes! <laughs> ah, Nurgle. Ah, you creep me out. So this is pretty awesome. Oh gosh, okay. Great Unclean One by Frank Haas. Frank converted this disturbing greater demon using the body of a Great Unclean One and the tentacle head, if you can call it a head at all, from a mutilous vortex beast. His vision was to create a greater demon that looked truly grotesque and terrifying rather than jovial like most great unclean ones. Jovial, yes, jovial. Frank made the base from a sheet of thick cork when he, which he painted to look cracked and parched as if the great unclean one has leached the life out of it. Well, so that's, um, that's pretty cool. Ooh, you look really cool too. Oh my gosh, you're some kind of demon prince. All right, let's, let's have a look at you. Demon Prince of Nurgle by Tom Moore. Tom converted the plastic demon prince by swapping his head with for that of a rot fly. He also added a couple of scampering nurglings to the model and painted them bright pink to make them stand out. Death Guard Hellbrute. Wow, that's cute. Cool. Tainted Armager. Look at that. That's really neat. Martin used the legs from a knight armature and the body of a fetid bloat drone to create this corrupted knight. It looks great. It does. He mounted the legs where the turbines normally sit and moved the plague uh, spitters up to sit behind the carapace. Martin also used a a few rot fly limbs. The rust on the legs were achieved using rhinoxide and troll slayer orange, stippled over, lead belcher, and washed with agrax urshade. Wow, cool. All these conversions look so great. Ooh, look at that. That's really neat. How did you use to do that? Take one of the lethal hex tiles from Warhammer Underworld. Ah, okay. Nice. Like this great. This looks good. Oh, cute. Small balls of green stuff and then they cut them to make them look like popping bubbles. Neat. Putrid painting. Ah! Why does he look so cute and chibi? Nice rust. All sorts of ways you can paint your Nurgle. Glory points, beast grave. Beast grave. 
Warhammer Underworlds. Tactics. 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 Ah! Blackstone Fortress, an army of one. Oh, is this another one where you just go by yourself again? Yes. Okay. So you did this in a previous um, White Dwarf as well, where you have rules where you just go alone with a lonely assassin, which is going to be the Eversor assassin this time. Let's see what you do. So you have a movement of five, <laughs> all the best defense, agility and vitality. For get going to the inspired side, you already have the best defense, agility and vitality. Whether you're in melee or far away, you're going to shoot. Awesome. That's cool. Lightning reflexes. When taking an, ex an executioner pistol weapon action, the Imperial Assassin Eversor Temple can attack twice for a cost of 3 plus or three times for a cost of 5 plus. It's nice. Uh, carry out each attack one at a time, one after the other. The target chosen for the second and third attacks must either be the same as the target of the previous attack, or in the same hex, or an adjacent hex to the target of the previous attack. Neurotoxin Injector. If this attack was a success, Neurotoxin Injector, it causes a grievous wound instead of a wound. I'm going to assume the neural gauntlet is the neurotoxin injector. Yeah, it is. Why they change? Anyway, um, unique actions. Melt a bomb. Take the melt a bomb resource card and give it to the Imperial Assassin Eversor Temple at the beginning of each combat. If this resource card was in a stasis vault, remember to place it back there after this expedition. Okay, so you just, yep. Get to just always have melt bombs. Killing Rampage. Each time the Imperial Assassin of Eversor Temple slays a hostile, place an activation dice in an available action dice space on his character card that has a value of one. Okay, so whenever he slays one, he gets another um, action. Neat. Bio Meltdown. If Imperial Assassin Eversor Temple is taken out of action, each adjacent hostile suffers one grievous wound. I thought that it was saying to do this by itself. Perhaps I misread it. No, yeah, that was, I was right. Yeah. Uh, when the Imperial Assassin Everson Temple ends an activation with dice remaining to use as Overwatch dice, do not remove activation dice with a score of one or reduce the value of remaining dice. Ah, okay, so you overwatch without any reduction. Cool. A secret agenda, slay an entire hostile group that had every model on the battlefield at the beginning of the round in the same activation. Cool. Yeah, I could see you being able to do that. Same, same. If there's a six, cause a grievous instead of, okay, so that's the same. Uh, oh, right. However, your def move is the same. Defense, agility, have increased the also his ability to shoot has increased greatly at this one so all good melt bombs he still gets each time uh, place an activation so that's the same that is the same and that is the same. So really he's just getting more powerful and harder to hurt. Okay. I still don't understand why, if he's taken out of action, why that is relevant at all. I mean, you, you fail the mission. If he's out of action, if he's taken out of action, so I don't, don't understand. Huh? All right. 
Aeronauta Imperialis, Penelope of War. Mm. Ooh, pretty. Pretty ships. An oath fulfilled. Ah, Middle Earth. Cool. Ah, the ghosts facing off. That fella. The king. The first act of faith. Oh, this is the story. The issue of White Dwarf is a little chunkier than usual. That's because it contains the first installment of James Swallow's Sisters of Battle novel Faith and Fire, which will be serialized over the coming year. We asked James to tell us what the story is all about. Uh, what's the story in a nutshell? The story is centered around two Adeptosaurus, Maria and Verity, who find themselves hunting down a rogue psyker by the name of Taurus Bon. They track him to the planet Neva, an ecclesiarchy world, where they begin an investigation into his whereabouts. But the more they uncover about him, the more they re begin to realize that something isn't right on Neva, and that a larger conspiracy is afoot. Dun, dun, dun. Somewhere? Cool. Well, I will not give away that because I don't want to get into trouble. Inside the studio. Cool. Look at that. And do you see that design? Look at that crazy design. How did he do that? He... He painted a whole load of intricate freehand on their robes. He applied the design with watered-down paint first and went back over the lines to make them solid. This is Thomas Elliot. This is crazy Thomas Elliot. What a great job. Well, that is impressive. <laughs> nice tank. Warm reception. Very cute. Mm, that was good. Ooh, nice. What a cool looking knight. And that's it for that one. Hmm. Well, there's a few things going on in there. Ah, so many nice paint schemes some really cool conversions. I do like looking at cool conversions. Ah, oh, that was great. And a full war band in of Warcry in um, a white dwarf. Cool. I've not witnessed that before. Um, I've seen they, they had little things before, but a whole war band for uh, Fire Slayers. Cool. Well, I am absolutely going to be reading through I'm afraid I do, can't, I don't think I can give away the book. I can't read it to you guys because that's, I don't think that's allowed. Um, but I will happily, quietly read it with you if you're also getting the white door. And we shall quietly know what's happening. Celestian Miria. Oh, she's a Celestian. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to read through that. So many great things. So in here what we got to see some really nice looking um, uh, Sylvaneth and some nice looking Oryxes. Oryxes. All that Nurgle. Which actually looked really great. I mean they were horrifying. But they looked great. Oh my gosh, so much horrifying. Some nice facing techniques and lots of painting styles. A new one-off character for Blackstone Fortress. Lots of stuff. Oh right, and if you enjoy this and want to see more of the other white dwarfs, uh, they will be in a link up there. Ah. I always have so much fun with these. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I will catch you later. Thanks. Bye.